Welcome to Lab 4 slash Week 4. This presentation is a lecture portion that will prepare you to complete Lab 4. Take the quiz and get the directions for Lab 4 and then be successful in Lab 4. Lab 4 is designed to introduce you to spatial interpolation techniques and to make you more familiar with raster analysis in ArcGIS. We didn't work a lot with that in 3.11, so we're getting a lot of practice here in 3.12. You'll be using with sample data collected by the Department of Ecology that has been used to test for arsenic and lead concentrations in the soil in Pierce County. In addition to the soil sample data, You'll also be working with census data to determine the density of young children in Pierce County. Using various tools and spatial analysts, we'll conduct an analysis of the spatial distribution of arsenic, lead, and young children in Pierce County and identify regions in which immediate remediation of highly toxic, toxic soil would have the greatest impact, i.e. those regions that have the highest density of young children and also high levels of toxic in the soil, toxins in the soil. As you progress through this lab and future labs, it's important to remember that it's okay to have problems. This poor guy on the right, I showed you the video in class, is having difficulties. I have difficulties with the data. I have difficulties with the procedures. Sometimes they don't work. Try to remember to not get discouraged when you get errors or when things don't go as planned. We grow most when things aren't easy. When we face these challenges, we actually learn more about the software. Look at it, look at it as an excellent opportunity to learn more about how the software works and also how to troubleshoot when you get out into the field and do this analysis and procedures on your own and remember that shovel if you're trying to plant a tree you step down and you hit a rock you don't just chuck the shovel you take a few steps sideways few steps forward steps back try it again to make that hole for the tree there are a plethora of old skills that will come into play if you'd like, you can pause this video and read these, but you've seen them before, you've performed all of these skills before, and practice them quite a, for a considerable amount of time. We're going to learn some new skills, which are coming up on the next slide. The new skills that we're going to focus on, or refreshers of old skills that are a little bit more involved, are we're going to add an, envir an additional environment setting, we're going to display X and Y data a little bit differently. We're going to download census data, this time grabbing census blocks as opposed to census tracts or counties. We're going to do some inter interpolation using the Krieging and IDW, which is inverse distance weighted method. We'll do some raster reclassification again, this time using standard deviation. We'll perform some map algebra, which is some raster calculator functions, which add up values within a raster to determine a phenomena. And then we'll work on some enhanced map layout techniques. The additional environmental or environment setting is, it could be two actually if you haven't been doing them yet one is the processing extent and you notice in this area hopefully you can see my mouse the we have same as layer base map and that easily sets it to the peer space map another one which I believe is new for you is raster analysis which is setting the cell size and then stating that the mask is the Pierce base map. Census data. In this lab you will download some more census data. It is important to remember that census data comes in two different bundles. One is the shapes which can be tiger or cartographic files 
The other is demographics, which is the information about people, as demonstrated in the top two right graphics. For the most part, we'll be downloading tiger and line shape files. From there, we will import them into our feature data set. This chart is available on the census, and it will help you determine what what data you'll need when you're working on your own. And one thing to remember is there is a FIPS associated with a lot of the stuff that we download and it you may want to remember that it's Federal Information Processing Standards. That's what the FIPS stands for. Census Data Shapes there are many shapes and they all are different sizes. We start out with the largest or the largest for our use which is the state code. Our state code is 53 and 53 can be seen in the state FP10 over here in this column on the bottom right 53. The next is county and we can see some of the county in the graphic on the left because everything is pink. Our code for Pierce County is 53 or 053. The next smallest is the census tract. And I've selected a census tract in the both the attribute table, of course, and the image on the left. There are 39 of the 14,000 blocks in this data. The area highlighted in blue is the census tract. We cannot see all of it, of course, because I've narrowed in and I've zoomed into a much smaller area. Moving further and decreasing in size is a block group. That is a one-digit code and is in yellow on the left bottom left of the screen and the top right of the screen of this graphic. Notice how in the block column block CE10 the first digit is all the same and that is the block code of 1 for all of the blocks in that block group. So the block group code is a 1. The smallest piece of data is the block and that is what we'll be using in lab 4. We can see the block because it's highlighted in yellow. Or, excuse me, the block itself is a yellow item circled in red. In addition, we have the number of this particular block within the block group, within the census tract, within the county, within the state. This number is off to the left of the screen. When we download census data, after downloading the shapes, you must download the demographics. The census suggests you find a topic first and then the geographies. I suggest going from the geographies to the topics and then the results because there is no sense finally drilling down and getting your topic data if there is not a geography for that data. Some more information on demographics. When selecting the data, you start with, as I said, a, we're starting with blocks. And I set my geography first. From there, I go in and choose what I'm looking for. In this case, I was looking for a certain age of people. And I came up with children. Once I get to that far in the selection process I can click in the checkbox for in this example P14 to obtain the data that I want. Eventually after conversion which I'll show in a minute we end up with this census table imported into our geo database. Preparing census data. Once the data is downloaded and extracted we need to manipulate the demographic information so that it works well in ArcMap. 
first thing to do is to open a blank workbook. From there, you're going to obtain data from text and get external data from text as the click that you'll do. Once you have that information, it'll come in looking like this. We have to change some field names. Hopefully you remember we have ID2 here instead of GeoID2 because the periods in the headers do not work. And then if we have any formulas, we're going to paste values so that when we paste the information, we actually get the value of the information rather than what was over here and you'll notice when you do the lab but a formula to add up the total number of male children over here I have the cells that were added to create that formula field and in this case in this dialog I'm pasting a special value in fact the total number of male kids rather than the formula Further along in preparing our data, I've now transferred the actual values. There are no formulas in here. I create a new name for the sheet so I can easily find it. In this case, I called it Use Me. And then we right click in our geo database and import the table. And this makes it much more easily usable within our ARC analysis. You'll notice in this graphic in the top right I chose to save it in an XLS which is Excel 97 to 2003 format. Although when I was demoing the lab it actually worked with the XLSX data. Another skill you'll do in this lab is to display X and Y data. You'll be provided with some sample data sets and that is sample in terms of taking soil samples that can easily be converted into a point feature because they include latitude and longitude coordinates. The display X and Y data procedure creates a temporary event layer in ArcMap. To make this a permanent feature, we'll have to export each of the layers to our featured data set. And that is as simple as right clicking and data export. We'll create the, once we have this data, we'll create a new feature class, amend the data of the feature class, and then separate out arsenic and lead sample points. All of those directions are fully explained in the lab directions. Interpolation, and in this case, Krieging. We can interpolate and classify arsenic and lead concentrations in Pierce County based on sample data points. The samples that were taken in this study of arsenic and lead do not enable us to know what the concentration of arsenic be might be under any given house or school in Tacoma, Lakewood, Firdcrest, etc. However, using ArcGIS, we can predict or interpolate the concentration of arsenic and lead between the sample points on the map. In doing this, we'll be able to visually represent the concentrations of arsenic and lead in a way that is accessible to the general public and to conduct analysis of the spatial distribution of arsenic and lead to isolate where these toxins coincide with regions that have high densities of young children living in them. Interpolation is one of the many tool sets that is found in the Spatial Analyst Toolbox. There are multiple methods of interpolation and most of them are in the interpolation tool set. For this step, we'll be using the Krieging method. Krieging is a statistical interpolation method that is often used to model pollution in urban areas, among other things. To do so, it quote-unquote 
fits a function to a specified number of points or all points within a specified radius to determine the output value for each location. And that was written by Childs in ArcUser September 2004. When you run the Krieging procedure, ArcMap will use a statistical model to consider the values of all sample points within a specified distance of each location in the analysis extent to determine the expected values at these locations. For this assignment, the Krieging process will cre create a continuous surface that represents concentrations of arsenic or lead at any given location in Pierce County. The Krieging process will return a value range that does not necessarily mirror the range values in the original sample data meaning the lowest concentration of Krieging output may be higher or lower than the lowest concentration in your sample data, and likewise for the highest concentration. I have provided written documents in the module for you to read about these processes. The IDW inverse distance weighted and spline interpretation interpolation tools are referred to as deterministic interpolation methods because they are directly based on the surrounding measures, measured values or on spe specified mathematic formulas that determine the smoothness of the resulting surface. A second family of interpolation methods consists of geostatistical methods such as Krieging and therein lies the difference. Krieging is a geostatistical method, which is based on statistical models that, have, that include autocorrelation, that is, the statistical relationships among the measured points. Because of this, geostatistical techniques not only have the capability of producing a prediction surface, but also find some measure of the certainty or accuracy of the predictions. Moving down to the IDW, inverse distance weighted technique. This interpolates a raster surface from points using an inverse distance weighted technique. This IDW interpolation determines cell values using a linearly weighted combination of set sample points. The weight is a function of inverse distance. The surface being interpolated should be that of a locationally dependent variable. And a lot of the instructions will be provided, or further instructions will be provided in the lab. We will also do some more raster classification. In this case, we're going to reclassify using standard deviation as shown in the images here. We'll go from about 9 or 10 classifications to break it down into 4 classifications. We'll classify several rasters according to the relative concentration at each location on the map. We completed this task in GIS 311, but we did not use the standard deviation. A new technique will be Map Algebra Raster Calculator. Once we have these reclassified rasters, we'll essentially stack them on top of each other and add the values within each of the very small cells. And that will give us an idea of what the total value or what we can, some results that we can make judgments on based on the number of kids, the amount of lead, and the amount of arsenic. The raster calculator functions similarly to the field calculator when working inside of the attribute table. Calculations that are performed in the raster calculator result in a new raster data set that has values equivalent to the calculation that we performed. For instance, in one of the steps, we're overlaying three raster layers, raster layers and adding the values in each layer to create a new raster layer in which the values are equivalent to the sum of all three layers. 
In each of these layers, there is a value of 1 to 4 or 1 to 5. Suppose one cell has the value 2 in arsenic reclass, lead reclass in the same area cell has a 4, remember these are stacked together, and the cell in kid density reclass has a value of 3. If we add them together, 2, 4, and 3, we get 9. After adding these three cells together using the raster cat calculator, the cell in our new raster that coincides with the input layer cells will receive a value of 9. In fact, all cells in the raster layer that is output by the raster calculator will receive a value that is the sum of the three input rasters. While we are performing a sum in this assignment, it is possible to run far more complex algorithms within the raster calculator so that your output raster layer can represent any combination or manipulation of your input raster layers. We'll also be focusing on enhanced map layout in this assignment. For example, you should definitely have a title and a subtitle and notice how this is acting as though it's a checklist. You should have a legend without underscores in the names and also don't label your legend with the word legend. Do you need a directional indicator or a north arrow? Usually not because we know that north is up. Do you need a scale reference or a scale bar? Probably not because we're not basing any travel on these maps. They're not used for navigation. It's more for informational purposes. Ancillary information or explanatory text that you should have on every single map are your data sources, the projection and coordinate system, the name of the analyst and or cartographer, which is you, and then contact information. In addition, you should also have information about the map itself, what analyses took place, and how you came to your conclusions. A neat line is often used around all components of the map, and appropriate inset and or locator maps can be used where necessary. Basic map design process, and this is a repeat from 311, but you should determine the objectives of the map, decide on the data layers to be included, in this case I'm telling you which data layers to include, plan your layout, choose appropriate colors and symbols, I have helped you with that as well, and then create the map. Remember that adding everything possible is not the best course of action, and for example I have one coming up in the next slide. This is Jackson Pollock, of course, but this is an example of adding too much to your map. Questions to consider. Who will be using the map? Under what circumstances will the map be used? Is the map likely to be copied or faxed? And that goes back to creating black or white, black and white maps. What objectives should the map achieve or what objectives are you trying to achieve? And how sensitive is the map information? Choosing layers. Which layers are important and how can you ensure legibility? In this case there are green dots on either side of the page but they're much more visible on the right hand side of the page. You need to make appropriate decisions based on what the map is actually for. Planning the layout. Obviously on the left we have a poor design because the map is very tiny. On the right we have a much better design but still they're not taking advantage of all the white space. Map layout balance. There's symmetrical and asymmetrical. Symmetrical is on the left and asymmetrical is on the right. You can pause this if you'd like to read through those other items. A lot of this information, by the way, is coming from a book by John 
Kreiger and Dennis Wood. It's called Making Maps, a Visual Guide to Map Design for GIS. It is highly recommended that you pick that up to en enhance your cartographic skills. Map Balance. Which of these has map balance? The map on the right is actually better because of the visual area on the top versus having the legend at the very top left. Components or pieces of the map. You should definitely have a title and subtitle, who, what, where, why, and when, a legend, and again, use good symbols and do not label it with the word legend, a scale bar, if you feel it's necessary, and there's a video about that, Explanatory text, I do. there is a video within the 311 area on YouTube to talk about explanatory text. The direction on North Arrow I already discussed in detail. Sources and credits, data sources is very important, and also any credits. Border and neat line, and then the locator map. In this ex quick example, obviously the image on the left is horrid. The north arrow is far too huge, whereas the image on the right is much more pleasing to the eye. Map layout focus. The title should most likely be on the top, as in on the image on the right. Focus on the most important areas of the map when creating the map remembering that people usually read from top left to bottom right. Visual center. On the right, the map achieves visual center, which is where the hashtags are. Sight lines. Too many sight lines make the map busy. We can still have an asymmetrical map, as shown on the right side of the screen, without having all of the additional sight lines that we see on the left side of the screen. Symmetrical versus asymmetrical. Personally, I'm a fan of asymmetrical, but you may be a symmetrical person. Notice there's only a couple additional sight lines on the asymmetrical map on the right. Choosing symbols. Natural earth tones usually look better than strident colors. Use pastels for the most of the map and use bold colors sparingly for emphasis. Take advantage of the psychological aspects of different colors and symbols. Mimic phenomena such as using blue to represent water versus using purple to represent roads. Just because it looks neat does not make it appropriate. Use color ramps and make your color ramps easy to understand. Apply emphasis with different color, size, and thicknesses. You can also use different shades and hues. Symbol psychology. Where is there less rain in the top left image? Which towns have more people? What is there? Think about the symbols that you use on your map and what they mean. Where is the water? Initially, if you look at the bottom left picture, you'd think that the water was up towards the top left of the image. And where is there danger? Red signifies danger and should be used sparingly. Improving a world map by using more pastels, some natural colors, using a ramp to indicate increasing population, and emphasizing the important information. The grid is helpful to the casual viewer, although on the bottom image it is much lighter and much easier on the eye. It's also behind the other layers. It doesn't intersect the features as it does on the top. Pay close attention to details. On the left we have a very crowded legend, an unclear name with even the .shp in there. POP 1990 isn't that understandable to the casual reader. You probably understand it fully now. 
Certain abbreviations are acceptable, but don't use obscure ones. And then work on your formatting. The numbers on the right are much more easily understood. Some more map layouts. You'll be creating hard copy maps for the most part in this course. And when you do, place the titles, legends, scales, and north arrows appropriately and only if they're necessary. You may also include tables and graphs and images or logos. We had an exceptional example of logos and images being used in the Lab 2 bonus maps. This is the layout toolbar. We have zoom tools, the pan, fit page, actual size, zoom fixed, previous next extent. The previous extent helps when you click on your map inadvertently. You may enlarge it or change the layout. Use change layout if you run into difficulties. Sometimes that helps fix things. The only way you're going to learn how to do create better maps is to create more and more maps and fix them and fix them and fix them. It's a process. Using your zoom tools. You may pause this to decipher decipher what is actually going on, but notice these are tool dif two different toolbars. Given the map in the middle, if we use the icon on the left, it will decrease the size of the items. Notice it's going from zoomed in to much smaller. If we use the item on the right, the tool on the right in that toolbar, it is going to make the whole page different. We use the tools toolbar to adjust the map extent inside the data frame. We use the layout toolbar, which is on the right, to adjust the page inside the arc map window. This is a very handy slide. Steps to layouts. This is a refresher, but it's worth repeating. Plan the map. Set up the map page and data frames. Add the legend, scale bar if necessary, titles and text. No, normally I don't add a quote unquote title because it is not very easily managed. I usually insert, insert polygon text. You may add objects, neat lines and backgrounds, graphics, and then focus on printing the map or prepare for printing or on the web. Visioning the page. Paper size. Is it landscape or portrait? In this lab, you're going to be using a larger paper size. Data frames. How do you position them? Do you use the numbers? Do you use a scale? Or do you just place them willy-nilly with the hand or the pan tool? Be careful of your margins. And definitely use a grid to help align your features. Ways to set up the map. You may use a predefined map template when starting the map. Set up the page size, data frames, and other elements yourself. Or, as mentioned earlier, switch to another template after the map has been created. This is where sometimes things get a little skew skewed and you must go back to this icon at the bottom and make sure that you're not on a particular template. Assigning frames, the data frame order. If you're using a template, this might be a helpful slide because we have South Dakota, USA, and then the three is the study area. And notice right now, one, two, and three. Three would be the USA. So this is a a very important tool to place the map that you want in the right place. Page and print setup. This is where if you change anything such as the landscape here or here you're just going to have to play with it to figure it out. Sometimes this will come out with your page going this way 
Your page will be portrait, but your map is landscape or vice versa. You'll have to fix that by hand once you start making those changes. Composing frames. Click and drag the active frame to move or change the size. You can go back to the data frame properties and set a specific size and position noting which corner of the item or which piece of the item is set up here in the position. In this case, this dot would be at 2.4 inches and the, also at 3.59 inches versus on the X and Y axis. X and Y. Scaling the map. Automatic scaling versus fixed scale versus fixed extent. Notice what happens to your map and what happens to your toolbars if you choose fixed extent on the right. You cannot do much to your map. You may have to go back to go to automatic scaling. If you have a fixed scale, the only thing you can do is pan the map. And then automatic scaling on the left is where you will have the most functionality. But as you get towards the end of your mapping process, you are going to want to use fixed extent. Basic principles for balance. Maximize size of map relative to the titles, legends, etc. Distribute elements evenly on the page, avoiding blank or cluttered areas. And align straight edges using neat lines to enclose map elements. Graphic text. First of all, I never use this button right here, new text. I always use rectangle text or polygon text because this item, Hi Mom, is very hard to manipulate. It's much easier to manipulate um, images or, excuse me, text with that was made with rectangle text. And then down at the very bottom is the drawing toolbar to help you manipulate the text that you insert. Multi-line line labels. Sometimes you'll need to manipulate this data. Notice the rectangle text is the one being shown right now. This one automatically aligns itself because it is in the rectangle text. If you use the hot one of these hotspot buttons or dongles, it will align for the most part as intuitively as you would hope. It does take a little bit of time to practice. The label tool. We've done a little bit of labeling in 311. You'll be doing a lot more. You also did it from chapter 14 in 312. Playing with these labels is how you're going to get better at completing your labeling. Adding a legend, of course, insert legend to do the legend wizard. You include what items you want on your legend and then you cite the title and font. Choose a border, choose a background, drop, sh drop shadow, and then in the area, this is important, make a good choice on these items over here on the bottom right. The patch size and the type. Notice you can set the patch size. The third part of the legend wizard, legend wizard, you can adjust every one of the infinite spacing items on the legend. Usually I leave the defaults but you can add more detailed, finite adjustments if you'd like. There are some legend styles. I encourage you to pause and look to see how they are different. Notice what we have selected up above with what you actually get. Changing the legend style is relatively easy. Once you start playing with these, it'll be much more It'll be much easier to do as you play with it with all of your maps. Managing the legend styles again, some more finite details and changes that you can make. 
adding pictures. This is simply done by insert picture, which greatly enhances the maps that you produce. In this example, we have a nice legend, although the legend word doesn't need to be there. We have some ancillary text talking about what is going on in the map. And then a picture has been inserted. Neat lines are used to grab everything in the map and hold it all together. There's an excellent example of a neat line on the right side of the screen. There are a plethora of choices. Don't make it too fancy, however. Here's the graphics and the draw toolbar again, this time with different things highlighted. You may pause and or go to ArcMap to play with some of this. Adding a scale bar. Infinite choices of what to do with your scale bar. These are just the basic components. If I slide to the next, we can adjust the divisional value. And then even further, adjust the division, the width, the number of divisions, etc. Simple adding of a north arrow. I think all of you have this nailed, although you may want to not put on north arrows when they're not necessary. Some text and titles. I just wanted to emphasize one last time, I would refrain from inserting a title such as being done in this screen. Try to insert the rectangle or polygon text. And this completes Lab 4 Lecture, the end of week 4, to prepare you for Lab 4.